Jeff came back to the church the next day and told the preacher that God thought he was a bad Christian for joining this church, why God himself didn't want to join this church. Saying so, he left the church. James Baldwin writes that the enslaved person was given Congo Square and the Bible that led to the formation of the black church and subsequently to black English. It was, and I quote, an alchemy that transformed ancient elements into a new language, a language which comes into existence by means of brutal necessity, and the rules of the language are dictated by what the language must convey. He concludes that for every speaker, the language carries an experience of the world they have inhabited, and for the black person, these stories come to express that very world the enslaved person lived in. One story talks of how the Americans were not at war on account of how a large sweet potato was sent to France and swayed the Kaiser to hang up the guns and ask for peace. War is something everybody has a vision and perspective on, but surely ideas of peace like this were not just a part of a collective memory, but a collective creativity in the work of making tales and creating new speech thought styles. The task of hermeneutics is to listen to the other carefully. By keeping aside one's own view of life, it is the art of letting someone or something be and speak of themselves. It is also to see what is unsaid. Many of these stories are the creation of a people wronged in their lifetimes, and what these tales meant for them were not merely a pastime, but a gateway to knowing about one's own condition and coming to terms with it through creativity. If one were to not see the world as an object, as it cannot be taken as a given whole, and rather look at it as a horizon that directs our view to the boundless, then this creativity becomes palpable in the form of literature. These stories convey different structures of feeling that help in envisioning these tales as arising from the idea of resistance and survival. One's horizon of expectation is noted to be charged and constantly altered with each telling because the teller's perspective on life is so diverse. This is a vast domain, and to say that one begins to comprehend what the narratives offer at the literal level is to barely scratch the surface of these stories. The first question that comes to mind is why the form of the story and songs, literacy not having been given to the enslaved, was to be understood as a means of escape for later black writers, as a means to witness the way in which one was excluded from a network of intertwining histories created and moderated by white male figures. These stories, however, form a part of one's education, a bilboom, because it corresponds to the act of getting to know the other and to think from their perspective. The voice of the slave subject, the individual eye of the black performer, and the collective eye of the race come together for this eye to emerge through the narrated descriptive lens, which was put into service as the literary form. These narratives were a way for the black person to claim authority as a person and a being in this world, as it came as a response to the much frequented saying that blacks cannot write. It was obvious that they could not write because they weren't given the chance to seek an education in the way others were. And that is where one can begin to underline the traces of the need for such tales. It is self-creation through representation with the help of metaphors, similes, and other such literary devices. If we take the character of Jack or John, we come across the trickster figure from African tales. The trickster travels from the deep south of America to become a John or a Jack and ends up in adventures where he finds himself as the hero or the anti-hero. Anna Bonteps writes that the folk tales were actually projections of personal experiences and hopes and defeats in terms of symbols. The story of how John saved himself tells us something about such a symbol. John told his master that he could tell fortunes and his master wanted to make money out of this. So one time John got lucky and was able to identify what was beneath the box without taking a look at it. The master got impressed and told John to keep the plantation and that as he was rich now, he would go to New York. The master also told John to do whatever he wished with the plantation. So John threw a party for all the black folks around him and by the time he was jumping up and down on the master's bed, the master arrived on the scene. The master vouched to have John hung by the neck till dead for his transgression, and John thought to himself of a solution. He asked his friend Jack to go and light a matchstick from the top of the tree on which he was about to be hung. As John was about to be hung, his master asked him for any last words, and John said he wanted to pray. So, so John said to God that in case God wanted to destroy the master's family and home, he should send lightning. And right on cue, Jack lit the matchstick. He did this twice to scare the master enough and send him away. These stories do not only talk about the exploits of the enslaved people, but are also a means of interrogating the ways in which the relationships between the enslaver and the enslaved developed. In many cases, we find that the master is a fool, and in some, he appears to be a wise man. This story perhaps tells us about how ruthless the conditions of slavery were and how easy it was to kill a man who appeared to have transgressed certain rules. Hermeneutics is the art of listening. The art of letting something be and speak of itself, also in what is not said. 
According to Gadamar, to speak means to speak to someone, which he, say, which he considers is not relegating the subject to an I, but a we. If one were to consider this, then language comes to be associated with a view of the world, a person belongs to, or inhabits him. One can never really pinpoint and say what the enslaved's world looked like, but these stories offer some idea of that world which they created. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So ma'am, the uh, idea is coming from the tales of Rare Rabbit and Rare Rare and also the fact that Zora Neumhurston is somebody who was an archivist and an anthropologist. So she becomes the keeper of the tales. Rare Rabbit and Rare Rare are literally like Jack and John the figures. These are also figures, animal figures, who seem to have certain kinds of human characteristics, uh, kind of human nature attached to them. They're like the Aesop's fables, which we read as children, they have that kind of a characteristic, that kind of a quality, that uh, these characters have uh, these situations in which they fall into, and they seem to emerge out of it using wit or intellect or cunning. And Rare Rabbit and Rare Rare are two of those stock characters from African-American uh, folklore, basically, mythology as well. Thank you. Uh, do you there's a question from you. Yes, ma'am. Congratulations. Thank you. Ma'am, um, your mic is muted, ma'am. Yeah. Can you hear me audible? Yes, 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 ma'am. Okay. So, can you give us um, you're working on Zora Dean first, right? Yes, ma'am. So, can you tell me who is the bird rabbit of Gurbir in Abir Bear? In uh, the eyes of watching God, who would you identify as this character? Uh, Ma'am, I haven't read eyes, the eyes of watching God as of yet. I've just been started to. I just started to look at her collection of her tales and uh, her collection of narratives, slave narratives, that is. But uh, I'm. I'll have to think about this one because I haven't read the rise of watching God. Bird rabbit and dark baby, uh, these things or uh, these symbols have been used by multiple African American writers. Yes. That's true. Well, it was a nice paper. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Riti uh, Sharma. Now we will move over to the next talk. Uh, Paper presenter. Uh, this is actually a joint paper by Dr. Deepshika and Jay Smitha. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Deepshika is a lecturer in English in Maharishi College of Natural Law, uh, Bhubaneswar. And the title of the paper is uh, Racial Trauma and Microaggression in Tony Morrison's The Bluest Eye. May I request uh, the presenters to begin their uh, presentation? Yeah. And Jasmita is an independent research scholar. 
uh, yeah, have you planned how whether you are both going to make the presentations or you know one after the other? Yes, ma'am. I will just introduce the topic and then Jasmita will carry on. Right. Thank you. Okay, ma'am. Good afternoon to everyone. I am Deepshika Rautra from Arshi College of Natural Law, Bhubaneswar. And I have with me Jasmita Kaur, an independent research scholar who is also from Bhubaneswar. We are going to present a paper on racial trauma and microaggression in Tony Morrison's The Bluest Tie. Now, with accounts of systemic racism across the globe, it is quite pertinent to discuss the distressing impact of living within a society of systemic racism. The raci racial trauma involves exposure and re-exposure to race-based stress, which can be of different forms, and microaggression is one of them. Microaggression shows how instances at micro levels, like insults and slights against black people, can have a detrimental impact on the mental health of those who experience it. The novel that we have taken up for analysis in this paper is Toni Morrison's The Bluest Style. It is a tragic story of Pecola Breedlove, an African-American girl longing for socially constructed idea of beauty. A study of a character will highlight the effects of internalized racism based on tragic events of discrimination and marginalization in Pecola's life and her psychological response to it. This paper will also focus on racial trauma and Chester E. Pierce's concept of microaggression to foreground the psychological distress that Pecola is grappling with in the narrative and how apart from acts of violence, offensive and derogatory statements made uh, against the people of color damages their psyche. Over to you, Jasmita. Thank you so much. At the outset, I would like to draw your attention to an article published in the first post on Black Americans, Collective Racial Trauma on 18th of April 2021. In this article, Carlyle Pittman, the co-founder of the Chicago-based youth organization, Good Kids, exposes us to the systematic racial trauma that plagues Black Americans. Pittman says, we are constantly turning on the television, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and seeing people that look like us who are getting murdered with no re repercussions. It's not normal to see someone get murdered by the click of a video on your phone, yet it has become the norm of our people, our, our black and brown communities. Pittman cites many instances in addition to George Floyd Memorial Day killing by a monopolist officer which sparked protests across the world. Such horrifying acts of violence against black Americans are not new, and it is extremely heart-wrenching to note the spiraling cases despite rigid policies and international laws against such discrimination. A study of racial trauma emerging from oppressive systems and racist practices helps us to understand the racist Racist practices de uh, deeply embedded in the fabric of a nation. Stories are the best way to understand the cultural fabric of a nation. Stories makes us experience rich emotions and feelings of joy, sorrow, hardships, and failures. Toni Morrison is one such storyteller who makes a reader feel all the feelings. A study of her narratives will, uh, will help a reader make cognitive and emotional connections that shape our perspective of the world. It helps one to analyze the life uh, experience of uh, racism and resistance in various contexts. Morrison's The Bluest Eye expresses the frustration of an 11-year-old Pecola Bridler following the devastating, devastating uh, emotional turmoil she undergoes being a black destitute girl. Heroing incidents in her life leaves Pecola dejected, praying for her eyes to turn Blue eye, uh, blue like the blue eyed children of America, to escape the drudgery of being born as a black girl. The focus of this paper is to foreground the elements of racial trauma and microaggression embedded in the discourse of the narrative. Eleven-year-old Pecola accept, accepts herself as an ugly girl and fantasizes about having blue eyes to feel counted in the world of beautiful people. Throughout the novel, the, uh, throughout the novel, she is imaginative and distressed, feeling isolated from the warmth 
and affection of a family and other people. Racism is like a regular activity in the room that we pretend is not there. However, we currently perceive that it's humongous and we are adept at taking over it, but it is far from the reality. Along with racism and sexism, trauma and microaggression situations leave a permanent scar on the psyche of girls and women subject to it. It is worth noting that microaggression is equally damaging to the psyche as racial trauma. On certain occasions, a small incident gets scorched into, the, into one's memory that affects one's survival and attitude towards life. These incidents con, uh, concerning African Americans as closely connected to the repetitions of exclusion and violence that lead to trauma. Microaggressions are derogatory slights or insults directed as uh, at a target person or persons who are member of an oppressed group. Microaggression communicate bias and can be delivered implicitly and explicitly. Morrison's first book, The Blue Tie, is the standard of beauty concern itself with the very existence of an unpleasant state of mental uneasiness pertaining to the personal mindsets of the characters, especially the protagonist Pecola in the novel. Pecola's attempt to search for blue eyes is implicitly representing the African-American strong desire for acceptance as valid and honor in the white-centric world. Pecola wanted to fit into the standard concept of beauty as all the world had agreed that a blue-eyed, yellow-haired, pink-skinned doll was what every girl child treasured. Pecola's desire can be read from Judith Herman's perspective of trauma. In her book, Trauma and Recovery, Herman writes, the core experiences of psychological trauma are disempowerment and disconnection from others. Consequently, traumatic events have primarily effects not only on the psychological structure of the self, but also on the systems of attachment and meaning that link individual and community. It is important to note that in the process of marginalization, their psychological safety is threatened as it has a damaging effect on their psyche which can be noticed in the case of Pecola. As Pecola internalizes racial prejudice, she crosses the border from sanity to insanity and starts hallucinating. As Morrison says, she is not, on, uh, not seen by herself until she hallucinates herself. In the words of the narrator, a little girl, a black little girl, earns for the blue eyes of a little white girl. And the Horror at the heart of her yearning is exceeded only by the evil of fulfillment. Piccola's yearning for blue eyes finally leaves her psychologically vulnerable and hallucinating. She enumerates that the way people notice her is more acceptable than what she notices about herself. She internalizes what white people think about her and then she thinks about it seriously and consider it as ugly. She takes consolation in a time of loneliness while uh, eating the candy. But in a more important and symbolic manner, she adopts the smiling picture of the blue-eyed, blonde-haired little girl on the wrapper. Pecola's feeling as she eats the candy is a metaphorical representation of her psyche. Pecola's wish for the blue eyes is her way to escape the microaggression situations she faced again and again. As the narrator says, it had occurred to Pe Pecola some time ago that if her eyes, those eyes that held the pictures and she knew the sights, if those eyes of her were different, that is to say beautiful, she herself would be different, pretty eyes, pretty blue eyes, big blue pretty eyes. Pecola's yearning represents the yearning of the black community to move from the marginalized space to the mainstream. This is Pecola's way of enduring her traumatized self. The following lines in the narrative substantiate her desperate attempt for it. Long hours, she sat looking in the, into the mirror, trying to discover the secret of the ugliness, the ugliness that made her ignored or despised at school by teachers and classmates alike. It had occurred to Pecola some time ago that if her eyes were different, that it is to say beautiful, she herself would be different. If she looked different, beautiful, maybe Collie, would be different and Mrs. Bridlove too. Maybe they would say, why at look at pretty eye, eyed Pecola? We must not do bad things in front of those pretty eyes. 
it is pertinent to note that all attempts to deal with microaggression lead to trauma current definitions have expanded the scope of microaggressions to describe both conscious and unconscious acts that reflect superiority hostility discrimination and racially inflicted insults and demeanors to various marginalized groups of people based on such identities as race ethnicity gender and gender identity sexual orientation ability religion class and age microaggression is usually expressed in three forms micro assaults micro insults and micro invalidations micro assault as a blatant verbal non verbal or environmental attack intended to convey discriminatory and biased sentiments there are several instances in the novel that can be related to such intended discriminatory attacks when geraldine a middle class black woman who hates her race arrives on the scene to face her inert cat on the floor she looks at pecola dirty torn dress unruly hairs muddy shoes and insta- instantly assumes the little girl from an impoverished family in the culprit starts hurling racist abuses as her with reference to upbringing while unjustly blaming her uh, of injuring her cat besides being an example of micro assault it is also an example of blacks who have internalized white society racism besides geraldine her son junior's treatment of pecola as she deliberately injures that cat and frames pecola is also an instance of micro assault micro aggression theory uh, micro insults are unintentional behaviors or verbal comments that convey rudeness or insensitivity or demean a person's racial heritage identity gender identity religion ability or sexual orientation identity despite being outside the level of conscious uh, awareness these subtle nubs are characterized by an insulting hidden message the ins- incident at the grocery store in the novel is an apt example of micro insult as it illustrates the cultural ideals and physical uh, psychological responses as a result of it Mr Yokobowski's treatment of Pecola at his grocery stores shows the extent to which racism is deeply rooted in the psyche of African Americans when Pecola visits the store to buy candies Mr Yokobowski fails to notice her presence in the store there is a total absence of human recognition uh, the glazed separateness for Pecola this vacuum is not new to her Pecola ref, uh, prefers to remain hidden from white eyes as a, a result of self disgust and humiliation Pecola's attitude reflects her acceptance of the treatment it can be read as a case of internalized racism the visibility of a person here depends on how beautiful a person is and blacks are ugly according to the white's idea of beauty here the shopping experiences of pecola reflect the way she perceived beauty The analysis of this course in the blue sky foregrounds the way an African American girl Pecola struggles to find her identity and how she deals with situation related to racial trauma and microaggression. This paper traces the way racial context manipulate the identity development of a protagonist. White people are glamorized as superiors and thus the quality of being attractive is presented in a prejudiced manner which makes a reader question the essence of beauty it raises pertinent questions like is beauty restricted to the color of skin can black be ever considered beautiful furthermore pecola's mental health represents the psychological impact of racial trauma and micro microaggression faced by numerous black people who often internalize and the discrimination they face in their day to day life that scars their lives the narrative presents a dominant view of beauty associated with color of skin and the social constraints faced by a woman of color pecola does not meet social standards being a black girl and is annihilated from the normal lifestyle even before she has stirred to a wistfulness of herself the blue star represents our society inability to deal with social psychological trauma as a result of white supremacy which forces the black people into severe socio psychological illusions this narrative is a testimony of the traumatic histories of the people of color that calls for greater empathy and activism as across the world 
everyday people of color experience racism and carry unhealed racial trauma thank you thank you uh, uh, dr deepshika and jasmita for for the paper uh, before i open it up for discussion uh, your paper talked about the impact of the racial trauma and the resultant uh, microaggression on the uh, black characters and women uh, you talked to focus on uh, people are uh, greater right so i was just wondering uh, You could say something uh, on the impact of the same uh, racial trauma on uh, a father uh, that is uh, Charlie Brinkman. Were you able to uh, get the question, ma'am? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, I was just wondering if you could comment also on the uh, trauma experienced by Pekola's father. Charlie Bridler. Yeah, uh, Pekola's father is Kali Bridler, who is a drunkard, and due to the traumas he went through, uh, through uh, went through his life, like beginning from his childhood till he commits the biggest crime. I can say uh, uh, that uh, he raped his one daughter, Pekola, and for which he uh, became. Uh, uh, in sen from the state of sen and uh, this is uh, i can say that they didn't accept what they are what they actually and they they are ignored by their own community as well as uh, as well as from the community of white so uh, this is my uh, this is my point of view ma'am i would like to add in something yes please uh, something that uh, i came across in one of the article that was uh, i mean when president uh, our former president uh, uh, barack obama was questioned regarding the state of black in america he responded by saying that that uh, the, the there are many lingering issues that is the result of a hidden bias that we all carry around he even said that according to implicit association test which is a kind of test that many of them go through to understand their own psychological bias Uh, with respect to blacks and whites where he says and i have a strong automatic preference for european americans compared to african americans too often racism has been seen but uh, racism is seen as a social phenomenon that happens to black people but it happens through black people as well and negative associations can thrust upon black people and black culture and color the way black people view each other so here in this uh, novel what we have uh, analyzed is that even the black people have a discriminatory attitude towards the black so it is a case where uh, that's why i have bought in this exam i mean uh, this response of uh, barack obama where he is also himself he is accepting the fact that how this is one of the lingering issues that all of them are carrying out and there is a hidden bias that we all are carrying out it is not just barack obama if you will come down to a situation in india we even here we talk about racism but we promote lot of things we can come across hundred thousands and thousands of advertisements where we promote the white culture so that's what i would like to say that sometimes it is a sadist response that's what when you asked about the uh, father that was the sadist response but what i want to just uh, focus on is that it is a sort of hidden bias that we all are carrying upon uh, since a long time and it's time that uh, we should show some empathy it is not it should not be restricted to just black lives matter our hashtags instagram post or facebook post and all it should be beyond that that's all madam thank you so much Thank you. That was a nice paper. Uh, 
The disfiguration affected the self-esteem and confidence of the veterans. Many chose to live in seclusion and isolated themselves from the society. Many were disowned by their family. They suffered all through their life in the darkness of helplessness, <coughs> rejection and isolation. The trauma and pain haunted them. This paper is an attempt to bring forth the loss of identity and the self as reflected in the selected American war fiction. Introduction. Identity is an integral part of a nation and a family. It is the identity that differentiates one nation to the other nation, one society to the other society, and one family to the other family. The cultural belief of the nation, societies, and families across the globe are mysterious and unique. Many writers have written about war and its consequences. War has always been negative in the context of violence and death. The fact that it can also bring about a change in the few or large mindset is conveyed through some of the developments that had happened during the wars or after the war period. The wars that brought about a change in the mindsets and led to few developments in the nation or society or family are reflected in the paper. War has always resulted in the loss of not life but also in the loss of one's identity and with the self. History and literature have mirrored the horrible experiences of la life during wartime across the globe. Humanity survives on ethics, morality of truth, and non-violence. We make one realize the value of everything that we experience before and after the war. The cultural and ethics that teaches us to fight for our nation or motherland on one hand to follow the path of humanity on another has created an empty space or void in which morality ha and ethics has no place. War has in fact brings out the courage in an individual, exploration and a quest of discovery. The confusion between humanity and patriotism is what resulted in so-called conflict. The work is an interconnected fiction bringing out the conflict between humanity and war in the context of culture and ethics. However undesirable they may be, wars have been a part of human civilization and in modern generation they hold mirror to oneself. Hostility and battle with oneself, along with love and sympathy, form the essential part of communication between human societies. War has always resulted in the loss of not life, but also in the loss of one's identity and self. The beginning of Americans' dream for superpower. It is rightly said that the in invention is mother of necessity. The earliest culture and civilization that took birth across the world led to several inventions and discoveries. It also led to many battles between the people who first occupied the land with those who have immigrated to the land due to innumerable reasons. A study of these wars display a gradual evolution of the American attitude of defense in the early years of existence, survival, settlement, and colonization to that of an attitude of attack and harmony maker in the later years of its fight for freedom and liberty, in short, independence. The groundwork for the borders were, was laid strong so as to defend the land from enroaching by the immigrant settler and also to safeguard the lives of that land property. This global frontier was not a boundary line, but a nation that was set in America by the Native American communities and the colonized Native Americans, or it was expected that would be only for these America and not for the immigrants from any part of the globe. When Columbus discovered America, little did he know that the condition of the nation or society would transform it to, into a boundary limit for many wars to take birth and lay the foundation for America to become a superpower. The America attitude of defense initiated with the Darwin's theory of the survival of the fittest. The war that seems to be and opened new avenues toward the, towards the spirit of nationalism. About the author, Timo Brain. Timo Brain is an American writer whose life experiences are much reflected in his works, marked by compassion of his soil and reality of the Vietnam War. 
After completing his undergraduation, he was absorbed for the military services in the year 1968. Tim O'Brien carried his opposition to war and started supporting and volunteering as a candidate in the present presidential election in the year 1968. This presidential election was against Vietnam War, and though he hated war, he had to yield to its out of patriotism towards his land. He was sent to army training at Fort Lewis, Washington, and he served as a regular foot soldier and gradually became became a sergeant. He found himself in the war zone for a combat and was injured nearly two times. In the year nineteen seventy four, he worked as national affairs reporter for the Washington Post. He started to write for periodicals and diverted his attention to writing. His works are regarded as semi-autobiographical in nature and portray the reality of Vietnam War. His works arose various avenues of painful emotions. His works convey some message to mankind for the need to live in universal brotherhood and create the identity or self-identity. The research paper focuses on war writing. and exploration of the identity and self through the consequences of war the most perilous and severe consequences of war is the loss that can be easily seen on human life they suffer from a from an identity crisis and they live to death in life in this context the study focuses on these trauma problems and identity caused by war therefore timo brain fiction on war time have been taken for study It is question on how individual can survive after have been traumatized and they witnessed them. War is ruthless, violent, cruel, and dehumanizing act of not moral and ethical being. Timo Brain has written about through the century have found war a productive ground for creating fiction, and the revelations of war trace on all aspects of human experiences and understanding. the paper is an attempt to bring forth the loss of identity and self as reflected in two of novels and stories of american war of time war fiction of timo brain war fiction timo brain works recounts his personal experiences in the vietnam war and allows him to remark on the vietnam war these interconnected stories are like spending long time with an old soldier allowing his memories to come to him gradually and slowly Although first expressed his Vietnam War experience through the memoir form as a way of lessening of trauma and psychological influences of the war though surviving the war and surpassing the historical limitations of the fiction are the characters themselves each individual has a different style with which he approaches a particular fiction particularly when the emotion induced by an action exceeds a character's cap- capacity to articulate it as in the death of ted lavender in the things they carried he speaks i quote a true war story is never moral it does not instruct nor encourage virtue nor suggest models of proper human behavior nor restrain men from doing the things men have always done if a story seems moral do not believe it if at the end of the war story you feel uplifted or if you feel that some small bit of re- it has been salvaged from the larger waste then you have been made the victim of a very old and terrible lie unquote timo brain touches on personal identity and trauma that it is that it is common philosophical struggle that soldier face with each other the use of several characters may also represent the writer's effort to reveal the similar actions through multiple crystalline lens timo brain has never been contented with the validity of america having sent its young soldier to fight the war in vietnam the matter is complex by the incidence of contradictory messages in the text his first book if i die in a combat zone box me up and ship me home conveys the vietnam war's dreadful terrible experiences of a young soldier it brings us to towards the dilemma of all those soldiers who served in the war the war that had no purpose for the per- for the person or family or society or for the nation violence and death belong to everyday life of the soldiers or combatants timo brain as an academic and intellectual opposes the vietnam war on ethical grounds in if i die in a combat zone timo brain takes the reader through a typical day in the soldiers in vietnam and learning about world war 2 from returned veterans he speaks i quote 
with a hangover and with fear it is difficult to put a helmet on your head and coat the hangover and fear made like that it is fear that one that ends one's character and identity it is anxiety and distress to oneself feels like that it's similar to the identity which through the tra- traces of traumatic memories of those soldiers felt and their memories of those hardships they felt his memoirs move back and forth throughout period flying between the months before he deploys into the vietnam war and his combat experiments and experiences in the arena in another instance he speaks courage is nothing to laugh at not if it is proper courage and this women who knows what can you hear me who is proper but can you come to this please yeah to conclude in the words of protagonist together we understood what terror was you are not human anymore for a shadow you slip out of your own skin like mounting shedding your own history and your own future leaving behind everything you were or ever wanted to believe in you know you are about to die and it's not a movie and you are a hero and all you can do is whimper and wait and the fact that remains it is not a movie where the courageous survive all the odds and emerge victorious the point here is that these soldier aren't courageous survive all the odds and courageous to kill human race but cowards to do so it is identity with soldiers that remain unfulfilled and with self identity they fulfill themselves the narrator mirrors the real phase of identity crisis in the context of ethical values and war a soldier that fights in a war has no identity on his own or perhaps a soldier who has added value to his identity or self identity the theme tone point of view style setting and storytelling act are all incredibly wonderful timo brain uses repetition as a narrative technique and repetition acts as a catalytic agent for the character's growth and development in the novel the style bring forth what is true and what is not true for the readers the narrative technique ties the past to present and further takes us to past to attach it to the present timo brain links landscape of war in vietnam to that land of immortal immortality there is war between the dark and light with oneself and the fear of the loss of identity and civilization across the globe the vietnam war has become a symbol of identity and memory and has articulation bring forth terrible images of war and its consequences in the life of soldiers and the life of people in the society as we go through his writings we can sense the identity issue among the soldiers thank you Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. I'm I'm Arti, ma'am. I'm Arti. I'm an architect. Arti, Arti, thank you for presenting the paper on your mother's behalf, and uh, yeah, that was a very good uh, attempt, uh, a good paper on uh, the loss of identity. So basically, you talked about uh, Timo Brandt's uh, fiction, where uh, uh, the focus is on how the consequences of war lead not only to loss of life. Uh, but also loss of uh, identity. Um, uh, I think that was a good paper. Uh, are there any questions from the online participants? Okay, if there are no questions from the online uh, participants, I think we will move on to the uh, next paper presenter. Thank you, uh, Sharmila Deshmukh, uh, you know, and thank you, Aarti, for presenting the paper. Thank you, ma'am. Good job. Now we move on to the next presenter. So may I now invite uh, Dr. Parvina, who is an assistant professor in the Criminal Justice from Georgia. Uh, she will be presenting a paper on explorations of black identity and black polyphonic voices in Alice Walker's In Search of Our Mother's Gardens. Who are these students? Uh, Jagrati Pandey, please. 
Is my uh, slide visible? Loud enough? Yes. Okay, I'll I'll start my uh, screen sharing. Am I audible? Yes, please. You are audible, and here, yeah, please begin your presentation. Okay. Um. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, sorry for the technical glitch. I uh, had to switch on to another laptop. Uh, I'm Jagriti Upadhyay. I'm from Sardar Patel Police University, Jodhpur, and. Uh, I would like to thank uh, my friend uh, Dr. Shruti Das for uh, informing me about this OUCIP conference and the organizers at the outset for uh, the acceptance of my paper. My paper is Explorations of Black Identity and Black Polyphonic Voices in Alice Walker's In Search of Our Mother's Gardens Womanist Prose. Now I'll begin with... Um, you know why women had already have all, always been marginalized as the second citizen meant only for uh, the private sphere in which they are supposed to fit in certain feminine uh, jobs so the first task of feminist criticism in the second wave was to disprove the assumption of the male canon of writing and criticism great works which were exclusively male authored with some exceptions like austen and the brontes and Dale Spender's man-made language considers that women have been fundamentally oppressed by a male-dominated language of phalagocentrism and male metanarratives. Now, phalagocentric language is linear, structured, decisive, and masculinist, and feminine is fluid and fragmented. 
and i'll quote john stuart mill in uh, from uh, the subjection of women he says that if women lived in a different country from men and had never read any of their writings they would have a literature of their own i am quote and then of course you have g h lewis the na- lady novelist 1852 uh, i quote the advent of female literature promises women's view of life women's experience in other words a new element and of course then we have the establishment of the female literary tradition by elaine show alter who talks about gyno texts and gyno criticism i'll skip that slide because of uh, time constraint she emphasizes the significance of women as writers and women also as readers now divided into four sections in search of our mother's gardens is a collection of essays that begins with how walker sets out to explore the works of black women and the trials and tribulations they underwent in the post reconstruction south in the 1920s and how the harlem renaissance the civil rights movement influenced the forging of black identity and the vocalization of their hitherto suppressed voices i have taken actually uh, seven essays from the first part and uh, two the interview and one essay in search of our mother's garden from part 3 of her narrative and tracing what jean tuma writes about black women as crazy lunatic saints their souls overflowing with intense spirituality walker contends that they were not saints but artists living a life of spiritual waste in an era of darkness and deprivation in the absence of education the agony of these creative women who might well very have been uh, well uh, very well have been poets or writers or painters and musicians they remained unspoken and they kept on toiling as unheard slaves uh, for decades in the white dominated america so my paper would be an attempt to underscore how walker's essays can be interpreted on multiple levels autobiographical allegorical and gynocritical through the tropes of and uh, metaphors of flowers gardens mothers and quilts uh, walker embarks on the quest for black identity through her comprehensive coverage i'm sorry uh comprehensive i'm trying to uh, you know um, make myself visible but uh, i'm sorry i'm not being able to do so there's no one to even help me here so uh, she tries to uh, uh, you know uh, establish a black identity through her comprehensive coverage of various aspects of scholarship of the phenomenal black women that make in search of our mother's gardens a rich and diverse history of a quarter century of womanist thought and uh, the striking one striking aspect of the book is the unique resonance of the term womanism acquired by walker herself which has subtle tones of lesbianism also in the chapters uh, and it's replete with a relentless search for black women's roots and role models and the ever present spirituality found in Afri- african american women particularly her chapters about zora neale hurston rebecca jackson phyllis wheatley flannery o'connor and uh, her relentless quest for black identity in others like jean tuma langston huge and coretta king i'll be i'll not be referring to the last three i'll be focusing only on the granophysical text now in uh, it is this search which makes her feel how these phenomenally creative women writers treated as the mule of the world were able to work and survive through many decades of abominable oppression and negligence it is this search of what kept alive in so many black women the nation on the notion of song so this is what she's looking for as to why they could still sing in spite of you know Uh, so much of oppression and i'm reminded of maya angelou's you know autobiographical work the first volume i know why the cage bird sings so critics have commented as walker's refashioning feminism into a new paradigm uh, before i go to the black critical writings that walker traces in um, in search of our mother's gardens i would like to first go to what women have to say about gano texts and gano criticism and adrian rich in when the dead awaken writing as revision proposes a radical critique of literature feminist in its impulse would take the work first of all as a clue to how we live how we have been living how we have been led to imagine ourselves how our language has trapped and liberated us how the very act of naming has been till now a male prerogative and how we can begin to see and name and therefore live afresh ayan quote 
Then I would like to quote uh, Helen Sisu from The Laugh of the Medusa, the concept of equity of feminine, that is women's writing. And she says, she contends that women must write herself, must write about women and bring women to writing from which they have been driven away as violently as from their bodies for the same reasons, by the same law, with the same fatal goal. Woman must put herself into the text as into the world and to history by her own movement, Ayan put. And then uh, addressing women as women in that inevitable struggle against conventional men, she exhorts women to write to let loose the luminous torrents of her creativity, her desires and her erotogeneity without being ashamed of her stirrings. To sing, to write, to dare to speak, in short, to bring out something new. She also interrogates as to why women don't reveal what they think is their secret, a secret that she hides as she would her masturbation, and tells women, write, let no one hold you back, let nothing stops you, not man, not the imbecile capitalist machinery in which publishing houses are the crafty, obsequious relayers of imperatives handed down by an economy that works against us and off our backs and not yourself, Ayan quote. Now, Virginia Woolf in a room of one's own is considered to be one of the most uh, uh, influential essays of the 20th century, which highlights very vividly and dramatically women's lacks of, mean of edu means of education and opportunity and the stifling of their mental freedom and creative capacities and she, in a very emotional um, tone, praises that if women had, uh, you know, 500 pounds of her own and a room of her own, she would be as great a writer as the male writers. And through the imagined character of Mary Seton, she, um, you know, argues about the emotions of anger, bitterness, desperation, anguish, and even inner strife that inhabit a woman's world. And through the invented character of Judith, imagined by Wolf as, as a very brilliant, talented, and ambitious sister of Shakespeare, but defeated by the conditions of women in Elizabethan times and driven to suicide, she imagines you know, how uh, the, the, the succeeding generation of women writers could be brought back to life. And then Lawrence Lipking in continuity of Virginia Woolf's speculation talks about uh, the silence of Arminist, Aristotle's sister in the literary tradition. So Walker in an interview uh, from the same book uh, contains, I quote, the writer like the musician or painter must be free to explore. Otherwise, she or he will never discover what is needed to be known. This means very often finding oneself considered unacceptable by masses of people who think that the writer's obligation is not to explore or challenge, but to second the masses' motions, whatever they are. Yet the gift of loneliness is sometimes a radical vision of societies or one's people that has not been previously taken into account, I unquote. Now, Audre Lorde, one of the most compelling voices, uh, she was a lesbian black feminist warrior poet, states that in each woman there are hidden dark places where the true spirit of women reside and rises, beautiful and tough as chestnut stanchions against your nightmare of weakness, I unquote. I'll skip this uh, part. Uh, no, she, she postulates that living in the European mode robs the black women of their own ancient ideas and roots because they are led to believe what the white fathers told us were precious. Like I'm reminded of uh, the earlier paper where Beloved is seeking, you know, corn hair and blue eyes. And Lord believes that poetry for women is a vital necessity and it can provide, uh, you know, a bridge uh, into the tangible action of language and idea. I'll skip this. Uh, she encourages black women to embrace the luxury of fearlessness and not allow the weight of silence to stifle them, but underscores, I quote, and where the words of women are crying to be heard, we must, meet, we must each of us recognize our responsibility to seek those words out, to read them and share them and examine them in their pertinence to our lives, I unquote. So in the exploration and analysis of Walker's essays in her book, In Search of Our Mother's Garden, it is essential that we look deep into the multiple themes of identity, historical racism, independence and inspiration, and the unique way in which he has dealt with all of these. In his piece, The Negro Artist and the Racial 
I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think you need to. Racial mountain transcend youths and the scores that the Negro artist can escape the restrictions that shackle him because he has a great field of unused material for his art. I unquote. And then um, she looks for a model in um, what you call J the the character of Jenny Crawford from. Uh, Zora Neale Hurston, their eyes were watching God, and she finds that, you know, Janie's refusal uh, for society to dictate her, taking on a much younger lover, and her freedom for, uh, uh, you know, her inspiration, inspires Walker, and then she dedicates her poem to Janie Crawford, which is on page 7. Um, I love the way Janie Crawford left her husband, the one who wanted to change her into a mule, the other who wanted to make her a queen, uh, a woman, unless she uh, submits uh, neither a mule nor uh, a queen. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you need to conclude in a minute because we have one more presentation. Okay, ma'am. So I'll just take uh, two minutes. So she uh, refers to Toni Morrison and, uh, uh, you know, um, Toni Morrison is a role model because she uh, wants to write the book that she wants to read. Then Walker also goes back to the, the old spiritual black magic, voodoo, and her African roots, traditions, and beliefs. Then I'll skip. She uh, talks about Flannery O'Connor, uh, her writings in Beyond the Peacock, and uh, she visits her house, and she finds that the daffodils her mother has planted are still flourishing. So this is how inspiration flourishes in uh, the black writings. Then, of course, um, Walker also uh, simultaneously invokes raw emotion and explicitly draws attention to the way material signs of disparity operate as symbols, representing operations that might be less tangible. Then she, in Gifts of Power, the writings of Rebecca Jackson, she um, reveals the many spiritual epiphanies that uh, Jackson has. And then she how she becomes a spiritual preacher and a Shaker leader in the Shaker community in a, a church that did not permit women to preach. Then in another essay, a writer, because of a not in spite of her children, Walker traces the life story of Beauty Amacheta, uh, who loves the sound of the noises that her children make in the background while she is writing. Uh, then uh, looking for Zora, the forgotten black woman writer who is relegated to a curio status after being at the acme of the Harlem Renaissance. She re rediscovers Zora's unmarked grave and then uh, eulogizes about their eyes were watching God and mules and men as embodying the uh, totality and essence of Afro-American women. She sings accolades to Zora Neale Hurston's uh, expressive metaphoric speech. Then I'll quit a, uh, a number of pages. I'll just come to um, uh, In Search of Our Mother's garden, uh, Gardens. And uh, she um, questions, did you have a genius of a great-great-grandmother who died under some ignorant and depraved white overseer's lash? Or was she required to bake biscuits? Skits for a lazy backwater tram or work her way, uh, you know, uh, from day till night when she wanted to paint colors of sunset or talk about the rain falling on the green and peaceful pasture lands and how her body was subjected to bearing children year after year. And then she says that interestingly, the truest answers to all these questions were revealed to her when she examined the care and feeding of her own overworked mother's creative spirit. She writes, it is to my mothers and all our mothers who were not famous that I went in search of the secret of what has fed that muzzled and often mutilated but vibrant creative spirit that the black woman has inherited and that pops out in wild and unlikely places to this day, I unquote. So in search of our mother's gardens, in, in uh, most significantly places importance on the mother as a source of inheritance, support, inspiration, life, nourishment, and instruction. In short, the mother empowers the daughter. And the rocky soil indicates the oppressive conditions under which African-Americans have produced art. But the cuttings that her mother distributes suggest that art can inspire, glow, and flourish in spite of all uh, negative conditions. That she traces the life of Phyllis Wheatley, who was a um, uh, uh, young poetess, uh, you know, and she ra started writing poetry in 1775, sold into slavery. She had dared to redefine herself from house slave to possibly an angel of the Almighty. Excuse me. 
Uh, yes, ma'am. I'll just just finish, ma'am. This is the last one. So there is an exquisitely hand pieced quilt that Walker saw in the Smithsonian Museum in Washington D.C. I've also seen that, and uh, she goes on to acknowledge that her mother's brilliant, ambitious flower gardens were indeed her art, her outlet for her creative spirit, and her means of holding on. Guided by my heritage of a love of beauty and a respect for strength in search of my mother's garden, I found my own, she claims, supporting her earlier challenge to all black women to fearlessly, fearlessly pull out of ourselves and look at and identify with our life the living creativity some of our great grandmothers were not allowed to know. I am I'm skipping all the other uh, slides, you know. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much uh, yeah, for coming to the uh, session. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. I hope I am audible. Yes, please. You are audible. Uh, yes. Good afternoon. And good afternoon, everyone. I'll start my paper without any delay. The topic is Forget Mother, Slavery and the Structural Eraser of the Black Mother in Gloria Naylor's Linden Hills and Bailey's Cafe. This paper aims to demonstrate how the history of African-American enslaved women's motherhood created an anti-black, anti-mother American social structure that upholds paternal supremacy. It reads in Gloria Nano's novels, Lyndon Hills and Bailey's Cafe, their depictions of the structural devaluation and erasure of black mothers in patriarchal white emulating families, right from slavery times to the post-civil rights era. While doing so, the Afro-pessimist lenses of Horton Spillers and Saida Hartman and the black feminist ideas of Bell Hooks and Patricia Hill Collins are taken as theoretical approaches. In the antebellum era, the enslaved black person was, according to Saidia Hartman, reduced by slave owners from a person to a thing that can be owned. Thus, African-American existence was precluded from the category of human and converted into a fungible commodity. Slave owners dehumanized enslaved people through torture, incarceration, humiliation, and the efficient dismantling of their family kinship and child rearing structures. The last was important because, as stated by Horton Spillers, if kinship was possible, the property relations would be undermined since the offspring would then belong to a mother and a father. Following the breakdown of their kinship structures, the slave as a commodity faced natal alienation to stop considering themselves as human. This natal alienation had significant gendered consequences. When slave owners attacked the enslaved people's kingship structures to degrade them to shuttle, they converted black women into compulsorily procreating wombs to ensure the steady production of offspring to sustain the slave economy. Black enslaved women were faced with the presumption that they should create families, quoted from Morgan, Jennifer Morgan, often through rape and violence. This structure redefined black motherhood in radical ways. The legal system of the time placed black enslaved children under the statute of parter sequitur ventrum, meaning the offspring follows in the condition of its mother. They were reared and weaned by their mothers for some time, but as asserted by Spillers, they were offspring who did not belong to the mother. By parter sequitur ventrum, the child was automatically a slave without kinship, possessed by the unrelated owner, who gave the child names of his own and could use them as he wished to. Slave owners actualized the property status of enslaved children by physically separating them from their mothers and very often reselling them. From an Afro-pessimist point of view, the black mother was therefore not merely underprivileged nor oppressed. Rather, the very term black mother came to indicate a very different kind of being, a breeding piece of property more akin to non-human cattle or factories. Anti-black slave society
society allowed the mother to exist only to give the slave owner the child and then undergo social and physical death black motherhood was thus a devalued erased mutilated and negative motherhood in linton hills gloria naylor depicted the historical and structural presence of black maternal redefinition and devaluation during and after slavery through the lives of each generation of women in the needy household in the novel's prologue luda needed the family patriarch and founder of the real estate paradise called linton hills married an octoroon woman he only called mrs needed to further his lineage Mrs Needed had given birth to a son who was a replica of Luther and even shared the same name the complete lack of variation ensured that Luther Needed's story remained permanent over generations the narrator says it seemed that when old luther died in 1879 he hadn't died at all especially when they spoke to his son especially when they glanced at the puffed eyelids around those bottomless eyes the second luther needed followed the same family narrative as his father to the extent of having a son who was his father's and grandfather's replica he too said the narrator brought an octoroon woman into his home who gave him only one son another luther needed such rigid adherence to a family narrative also implied that every needed bride enter the house as a nameless faceless character called mrs needed her sole purpose was to breed luther needed anew without leaving any stamp of her identity or existence on the house husband or child she demonstrated at first glance the dispensability of the mother in the patriarchal nuclear family narrative however the needed house also conflated the slave owner's house with its nuclear family structure despite their racial characteristics all versions of luther needed were free black men who were landowners slave dealers friends of the confederacy and slave owners by contrast all the lead needed wives who lived before the abolition of slavery were enslaved women The oldest of the needed wives depicted in the text Luana Packerville was bought by Luther who had promised her freedom after her marriage after her child's birth Luana found out that Luther had denied her papers of emancipation keeping her enslaved all her life being a slave woman Luana found her place in a legitimate kinship structure rendered impossible instead of having familial relationship as a wife to Luther she was a dehumanized breeder with only property relations with him Luther's denial of manumission to Luana also meant that her child was also his slave by the law parter's secretive ventrum and made to face natal alienation from her. Luana had recorded this instance of legal dehumanization in her journal. Luther told me today that I have no rights to my son. He owns the child as he owns me. When Luther gave the child the manumission papers and Christians him Luther in turn after weaning he dismissed Luana's biological rights as a mother. he placed the child in a slave owner kinship system that's the son of luther needed which also meant that luana was now related to her own son as property further she had lost her use value as a slave to produce a single luther needed in that generation and wean that child the child was weaned last month she said he was well past due and could now take solid food without harm she indicates the end of her service life in effect she was rendered socially dead forced to abject her child through legalities Historically slave owners also subtly actualized the loss of enslaved women's motherhood through harsh work conditions. They ensured that the enslaved mother could not take care of the child throughout the day without significant risk to her life. According to Bell Hooks and Patricia Hill Collins, it was through Monday nights of feeding, cleaning, mothering and teaching their children that black women did the important mother work of imparting personhood to their children. These domestic activities were crucial for women to assert and make sense of their motherhood and humanity. and reaffirm their socially obliterated kinship bonds with the children slave owners thus attempted to restrict black mother's subversive mother work in her home place by assigning slave work to her in practice therefore ontological violence caught up with the enslaved mother's mundane existence luther reinforced luana's legal ontological dehumanization by restricting her mundane domestic attempts to mother her child she had attempted to assert her existence in her son's life by cooking for him and this altered luther's narrative strategy of making her dispensable cooking would have reminded the child of his biological dependence on her and made him acknowledge his biological relationship with her to a degree she had also perhaps attempted to uh, preserve her use value to the needed household by demonstrating her skills at cooking her bold step of baking molasses cakes for his son to to attempt him into breaking this forced objection would have also demonstrated her high exchange value I saw he was sorely tempted she wrote in a journal indicating her freeman son would have wanted his slave mother for himself as an almost mammy like figure luther swiftly intervened having understood the strategy very well 
he restricted her ability to reach out to her son through acts of service, denying her the use of mother work to assert her survival. He also ensured that his son never replaced the white slave owner ideology he had painstakingly taught him with any sense of a black enslaved peoplehood. His counter strategy of employing a new housekeeper disposes of her as the child's mother and a slave. She was in effect as dead as a slave because her owner, Luther, had denied her flesh and labor any further use value. Luther had erased her lives to slave motherhood through the restriction of, on her son's consumption of her food. He and the child would eat from the housekeeper's hands. The redefinition of black motherhood as negative motherhood persisted after emancipation and the introduction of the white nuclear family structure to black freedmen. In her book of Woman Born, Motherhood Experience and Institution, Adrian Rich described property ownership as the black backbone of the white nuclear family. She stated that men extended the idea of ownership to their biological children to bequeath their maternal property and ensure their spiritual immortality. Through control of the mother, she stated, the man assures himself of the possession of his children. The mother, therefore, was the first piece of property man had to own. Disposable after the more valuable, pro valuable property the children was given to him. When white emancipators enforced the white nuclear family structuring on black people, the black mother as ex-slave had to retain her property status because she was transferred from ownership of the slave owner to the ownership of the white abiding black patriarch. In practice, she retained much of her existing slave woman status as far as the children were concerned. Further, despite emancipation, the slave owner's ontological violence had marked African-American people as people whom slave owners had once turned into non-human fungible property. Freedom was simply a process by which the slave owner willingly relinquished his hold on the capital and the exchange value of the slave. It was a transaction that the slave owner could threaten to revoke through structures like racist law enforcement and denial of fair employment opportunities. A pamphlet titled Advice to Freedom stated that with the enjoyment of a freedman's privileges comes also a freedman's duties and responsibilities. Unless you are prepared to meet them with a the proper spirit, you are not worthy of being a freedman. This threat framed the subsequent devaluation of black motherhood in American history. Marked as a descendant of a breeding non-mother, the free black woman regularly got erased from her children's lives by anti-black society through criminalization as the neglecting welfare queen or abusive crack addict. In Bailey's Cafe, Naila combines the criminal status of the crack addict mother. Ma'am, I will be wrapping up in the next two minutes. Yeah, because uh, we have a session scheduled at 3.45 as you can see. All right, ma'am. I will wrap up in the next, gen no, next two, three minutes. In Bailey's Cafe, Naila combines the criminal status of the crack addict mother with black maternal devaluation in a highly patriarchal white emulating nuclear family. Jessie was a devoted white and mother who tried to keep her individuality alive as a woman in the King household ruled by the misogynistic Aunt Eli. Like Luther needed in Linden Hills, Aunt Eli endeavored to omit Jessie Bell once her child was born and make the child a king only. When Jessie gave birth to her son, his remarks sounded eerily like Luther needed's attitude towards his wives. Look what Jessie Bell has given us. Eli hijacks Jessie's rights over household duties and outsources them. We got the nanny handpicked by him, of course, she says, and we got a tutor. In a reinstitution of kinship breakdowns for the enslaved during slavery, the King family dismissed the Bell family's connection to Jessie's son. They ultimately dismissed Jessie's kinship with her as well. The best started to mean, she said, that anything that had nothing to do with the Bells, and it ended up meaning anything that had nothing to do with me. Uncle Eli's tendency of never calling Jesse a Mrs. King indicated that he was in denying her membership to the King kinship system and ultimately excluding her as a son's kin. Jesse was considered socially dead after she did a work of childbearing. Her subsequent failed interactions with her husband and son, she compared herself to a dead woman. Yes, ma'am, I'm working up. Just, uh, complete concluding remarks, please. Yes. It might have been a dead woman ranting at them. Uh, in this paper, I would have continued with Jessie Bell's ultimate uh, fall into heroin addiction. I am not going there because of paucity of time. But I would just like to say that Naylor tapped into the American war on drugs environment in the 1980s and 1990s to plot Jessie's undoing. Because uh, it, the war on drugs ushered in legal, journalistic, and social hysteria to save black children from their mothers who did drugs and indulged in promiscuity. Since Jessie Bell, because of her heroin addiction, 
uh, was marked as criminalized, as I had discussed before, she was ultimately separated from her son and was put into prison, which signaled her ruin. In conclusion, in the introduction of Afro-pessimism, the editor state that formerly the black subject was no longer a slave, but the same formative relation of structural violence that maintained slavery remained upheld explicitly by the police and white supremacy, preserving the equation that black equals socially dead. This happened to all of Naylor's characters here, Luana Packerville, all the women after her in the Deed family and with uh, Jessie Bell. Public discourses like the Moynian Report de demonized women like Jessie Bell and it continues to do so today. Thus, all the needed wives after Luana were victims of a larger agenda of black maternal ontological violence centuries after abolishing slavery, and so was Jessie Bell. Unfortunately, despite significant social changes between their historical timelines, the structural status remained the same as the enslaved woman with no rights to her child. Thank you. Thank you, Mandi Yamini. Uh, it's nice to have you because we have absolutely run out of time. Uh, Thank you, ma'am. Uh, but there is a question, very quick question, and... Yes, ma'am. Can I put a question to ma'am, uh, to Ms. Mukherjee? If the chair yes, yes. yes ma'am, please. Uh, um, ma'am, a beautiful paper. It was like really, really, you know, captivated. One question is like, uh, you sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, uh, there's already a question which, uh, you know, uh, we have taken. So please uh, take this question and read that to others if we have time. Yeah, uh, that was a good paper, and I just response. Right? Yes, sir. You were mentioning, you know, uh, white nuclear family as being the model discussed about the blacks, even after, you know, the end of the slavery. But, I mean, empirical, now, I'm, this is my empirical uh, understanding that families of South and North, yes. Southern families, Southern black families, are obviously different from the family structure of the normal city, right? Yes. It, it, it is very, very uh, diverse and uh, the role of the black church, okay? Yes. Religion is very strong on uh, African-American identity, right? Yes. So, uh, what I was just suggesting is that maybe we should uh, take a more nuanced, you know, kind of stance instead of uh, making a very uh, general statement like the white nuclear uh, the family structure of the whites uh, is somehow you know uh, automatically uh, accepted or uh, implied by uh, by the blacks. Um, sir, if I may answer this question, thank you so much for this comment and question, sir. Uh, Ma'am, may I please answer this question? Uh, yes, so I was concentrating, I was not thinking of uh, of white and black difference as a demarcated difference between two certain kinds of people, but I was thinking of them as two certain kinds of ontological structures. Because of Western philosophy and Western uh, sociology, the white family system and ontological structure uh, became, in a way, the default. and. As there are a lot of black families which adhere to the structures which uh, end up getting criminalized to a large extent, particularly the case of single mothers or welfare queens or crack addicts, as I was mentioning, or I failed to mention because of paucity of time. Uh, this is the particular type of uh, you know, devaluation, kinship, kinship devaluation and black and white difference I was trying to indicate through this paper. I did not intend for it to come across as a very binarized uh, division. Uh, I accept nuance, but uh, it is also true that uh, such a binarization is, however, still visible uh, if some of the parameters of understanding kinship are, kinship are only slightly shifted. Um, thank you, Lavi. I know I'm sure there are many other questions, but thank uh, you. Uh,
Give me the presenters. Uh, in the next session, they are there. So we will just take a very quick break and reassemble for the next session. The next session is supposed to start at 3.45, so that gives us maybe just a minute or so. Thank you, thank you very much.
Hai Samuel. Di kita. Samuel should we start? Samuel, I think we should start. Hello? Is anyone around? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, because it's almost four o'clock. Yes, that's fine. So why don't you start? As Sabin for the sir is chairing this session, we are waiting for him. Uh, there is something. You waiting for the chair? Why yes. don't we telephone? Yeah, we are calling him. Uh, we are calling. Him. Okay, so it's raining. There might be some network issue. Yes. Uh, we'll take a call in another one minute. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Now we are pleased to invite the chair, Dr. Sabin Sauda, an associate professor from the Department of English, Usman University, to preside the presentation for us. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. We have the first paper presentation, Shivani Prakash, who is the 
college from Patna University, presenting a paper on major themes and concerns that carry a great of the incident in the life of the paper. the language of the state which is primarily rhetoric and persuasive and the language of poetry which is primarily a resistance to which falls uh, to such false rhetoric and persuasion while both these languages use metaphors and language by default as rhetoric the status and the language of poetry serve different functions lord tries to understand the difference in function of both these languages in the poem the poem opens with these lines i quote uh, the difference between poetry and rhetoric is being ready to kill yourself instead of your children. Now, how does poetry kill yourself or how does rhetoric kill your children? The definitions of these two words in the Oxford English Dictionary locate them in different perspectives. While poetry is an imaginative or creative expression of thought or feeling, rhetoric is a tool that helps the artist, uh, the subject or the speaker to persuade or influence others. This art of persuasion can be used to convince the audience towards a particular thought or ideology as well. Lost choice of arrangement of words makes the whole line seem ambiguous. The word yourself, which stands as a single word and also as an independent line in Lord's poem, causes ambiguity. This could make the reader question the subject and object of the act of killing and hence also function of poetry and rhetoric. Language is inherently rhetoric. La literature uses the device of rhetoric to great extent. Lord's poetry does not escape it either. Here, Lord's difference between poetry and rhetoric can be kept in parallel to Morrison's resistance framework and status or dead language. In her speech, Transformation of Silence into Language and Action, Lord explains the importance of transforming experiences of violence and oppression into words rather than silence. She confesses her past failures of expression and identifies her fear of death and pain as causes of silence. Lord overcomes her fear, raises her voice, and attempts to record a history of violence and oppression through her poetry. Poetry here thus becomes a selfless act as it re uh, recognizes violence despite the risk of putting the resisting self in danger. Uh, poetry hopes to build a better future for the children. The second, second stanza of uh, power describes a very violent circumstance um, where the state uh, uh, the uh, the line I quote the line a desert of raw gunshot wounds and a dead child dragging its shattered black face. Here the gunshot wounds indicates the violence of the state and power and shattered uh, black face indicates the attempt to erase identities. The poet imagines the dead child to be her son. The child represents a younger generation that is recipient of hatred and destruction. Nevertheless, the poet tries to convert this hatred and destruction into power. Lord translates and narrates their fear and uh, the policeman's and thereby the state's violence into words through her poem. Uh, Morrison believes that a language which persuades others to subscribe to a certain ideology is a dead language. Rhetoric thus is a dead language which can depict a police officer who killed an innocent child as not guilty. Um, this language of power becomes louder than the physical evidence recorded. The poet mentions uh, the tapes to prove his guilt. Nonetheless, the dominant ideology and its power assuming followers manipulate and interpret evidence of uh, evidence and justice. The policeman's language commits violence not only towards the dead child, but also towards his community. He says, I quote, I didn't notice the size nor nothing else, only the color. This is an example of a violent language. The policeman utters with the conviction that the child's color is a crime and hence his actions justified. Moreover, the judicial and so, uh, social systems which do not punish and instead approve such ideologies are also violent. These systems are violent as they perpetuate it, not by checking on such actions. Now, Stephen Newton uh, in his uh, essay has shown how there is a dis disproportionate killing of blacks in US police, office, uh, police force. Uh, Lord in the poem tries to point that this faulty structure of the system as she questions the authority for legal decisions taken in favor of the murderers. 
the poet says that 11 white men and one black woman gave the verdict to set a guilty man free despite any phys uh, physical evidence the identity of people who makes rules and pronounce judgments against whom is hence uh, crucial here when the black woman says they convinced me the violence of the language of persuasion becomes evident they always stand in the subject positions and uh, they do the action me acts only as a object me stands at the receiving end of the action which is convincing a dead rhetoric status language persuades a black woman with all her inherited sense of victimhood that the white man is always right and despite evidence cannot be questioned the charade of convincing and getting convinced in the entire judicial procedure is a continuum of the historical violence inflicted on the oppressed this is how a dead language operates lord like morrison recognizes this violence this is the context that lord provides for morrison's framework of a dead language of a status language the lack of understanding of the difference between these languages may cause violence lord further explains this with an example she says that unless she understands the difference between them she would rape an 85 year old woman and would merely say uh, or react as poor thing she never hurt a soul what a beast they are lord through this instance tried to explain how the dominant white community has easy access to empathy a language that empathizes with a white woman uh, provides excuses for the violence towards a black child this is a dead language a dead language of power foregrounds color and race as crimes however between the lines lord also tries to indicate that in any community women and children are the most vulnerable and the most targeted lord through her poetry tries to protest against this use of rhetoric by understanding the difference her better understanding and distinction helps her to put rhetoric into better use in her poetry power is a highly self reflective poem and through this poem lord unfolds various nuances of silence and resistance the difference between poetry and rhetoric is thus the existence of the poem itself through the poem lord contextualizes how the state uses its violent language to narrate a dominant point of view she also shows how her language the language of poetry distinct from distinct from a dead status language which ejects violence now this next section will uh, deal with an alternate framework that they try to build uh morrison uh, in her uh, uh Mor in in morrison's uh, folk tale when um the old woman presents the group with a silence for their question they ask back um is there no speech and uh, this itself is uh, very self reflective towards the framework um because morrison does not uh, give a lecture instead she presents a uh, a folk tale the silence of the uh, woman itself the old woman says that she is keenly aware that no intellectual mercenary or in, no insatiable dictator no paid for politician or demagogue no counterfeit journalist would be persuaded by her thoughts that is why she presents the silence the old woman's silence is not influenced by fear of death and pain that lord talks about power did not force her into silence instead her silence is a rhetorical art Cheryl and Glenn Krista Ratliff talks about it. They say that silence can induce a prolonged and effective impact on the listeners. They argue that the art uh, of silence and listening are particularly effective for historicizing, theorizing, analyzing, and practicing the cultural stances and pow power of both dominant and non-dominant groups. Um, Irigiri also talks about how we need a different framework, uh, especially for women. a framework that is very different from the patriarchal uh, patriarchal sameness that we are thought uh, taught um that unless we uh, find a new system a new framework and structure we will fail in expressing our experiences lord and uh, uh, morrison also try to do the same to develop a new framework uh, the and this is what they try to uh, both the women try to do in their framework they control and dominate the uh, sorry so, uh, excuse me uh, so the conventionalities that exist had to be rewritten and reframed for the marginalized to have their own space and structures the constant deconstruction and reconstructing a framework attempted by the marginalized are part of this process morrison also talks about some tongue suicide how languages die Han Kureishi uh, in his uh, essay Loose Tongues also uses the metaphor of tongue to talk about languages. 
he says that loose tongues are those that speak a language which is unpleasant and unacceptable to the authoritarian system he says that loose tongues break silence he says that uh, state imposes restrictions and te- te- teaches children what to say and what not to express they learn how to lie and conceal their words if they are lucky they become creative and use metaphor this is uh, what morrison is also morrison or lord they are also trying to do the same thing they employ literary tools such as metaphors and reinvent new frameworks to break, break silence as well as record them author lord uh, i am also looking at two poems here author lord's poem four uh, where she uses employs the tool or technique of metaphor and also her poem prologue now prologue uh, like the word itself suggests as two parts pro and log the prefix uh, of speech so the, the poem stands as a prefix and an entry and introduction to how she breaking silence uh, the poem starts with a passive voice haunted by poems that begin with to deliberately refrain the subject i in the active voice i stands for individuality a poem that opens with i would be confident opinionated personal and hence deeply political those poems haunt her as they can cause the poet pain and death she fears that these uh, kind these po- poets might poems might cause her pain death uh, she might be killed that her works might be buried but then she also remembers that all the things that are buried uh, will also grow um, and she uh, compares blades of grasses with uh, she compares blades of grasses with children and she trusts her children to continue singing the songs and lessons that she has initiated she breaks the silence of uh, chain of silence and passes the baton of words to the next generation through the poem uh, cole also uses metaphors uh, where she is uh, the she lord silence a lot silence hides behind these metaphors lord starts the poem by asserting an identity identity she is black so she feels constrained inside given the racial conditioning yet she speaks these are the characteristics that the poet assigns to the self i the earth bearing of resources and beings within itself alludes to the gender of the poet as well so she is uh, hence a black woman writer the metaphor of coal uh, comes into play in the absence of the word itself that is the word does not appear in the entire poem uh, however the image of diamond is used as a foil to execute the metaphoric image of coal diamond and coal uh, though formed by carbon bonds have different material price and value attached to them similarly words have colored with different ideologies and the political stances will have different prices to pay uh, hence lord says i quote colored by who pays what for speaking it indicates that uh, responsibility does not lie within the words themselves but in the identity of the speaker and the social location of the source she continues in the second stanza to compare between words and diamonds she says that some words are open like diamond and in this context she is trying to say about the clarity and transparency of words and some words are uh, not metaphors and they do not hide behind uh, meanings such words might come from a different uh, or confident source like an authoritative state though an oppressive state is language might also employ metaphors their purpose would not be aesthetic sorry okay uh, while some words are glorious splendid with all its like luster some are ugly and uh, torn as they stand as evidence of war's fought these words that undergo restrictions uh, these words undergo restrictions and censorship she compares those words to stubs of perforated books whose pages are torn away in the later half of the stanza uh, she talks about how some words uh, be devil her uh hanif qureshi also talks about this she says that writers or artists pay for what they say or represent they take the punishment uh but then shima saini also talks about the government of tongue uh, where uh, words have their own authority their own um, existence that they cannot be controlled by the author in call lord gives the words uh, that refuse to breed in her throat those that are gypsies who cannot idle and decides to wander the authority to overpower her authorial self she understands their autonomy and the power they possess to govern themselves lord this tries to break silence through a new framework and language that she reclaims and reinvents morrison on the other hand records silence as well she shows how the silence as a text can invoke a 
yes ma'am i'm i'm that uh, she shows how the silence as a text can invoke a language that is ca capable of fighting the authoritative violent state and its language thank you yeah uh, can uh, the can you introduce the next uh, paper presenter so we will take the questions if anything is there uh, at the end of the session thank you sir good afternoon sir uh, should i start yeah go ahead thank you thank you so much uh, a very good afternoon to all of you esteemed professors esteemed chairperson and moderator of the session and my fellow paper presenters present uh, both virtually and physically a very good afternoon to all of you my topic is uh, tony morrison's home and eco linguistic analysis so should i uh, share my uh, slide that yeah, you uh, can okay. thank you thank you sir uh, i hope my slide is visible yeah yeah very much okay thank you uh, so mm, uh, my topic is tony morrison's home and eco linguistic analysis and uh, i am going to present my paper to this ppt that summarizes uh, my entire article michael halliday's paper on new ways of meaning the challenge to applied linguistics that was published in 1990 laid the foundation for research in eco linguistics where linguists consider the ecological context and the consequences of language the term eco linguistics emerged in 1990s uh, as a new paradigm of linguistic research that uh, takes into account not only the social context in which the language is embedded but also the ecological context in which societies are embedded so the major concern of halliday in this area of language study was to make linguistics relevant to the issues and concerns of the 21st century particularly the widespread destruction of ecosystems he gave uh, many examples like economic um, he gave the example of economic growth where he described how the orientation of english language with regard to unmarked terms such as large grow tall and good gives growth a positive aspect despite the negative ecological consequences uh, they have this area of language study has developed considerably in the direction of analyzing the ecological impact of specific discourses rather than languages in general this approach to language basically has to do with the application of critical discourse analysis or in short cda to texts in relation to the environment to uncover the belief that there are hidden messages in such texts uh, i um, uh, refer to aaron stebe who wrote a seminal book on this theory eco linguistics that was published in 2015 from rutledge eco critical approach i quote uh, aaron stebe again eco critical approach to linguistic analysis includes analysis of any discourse which has potential consequences for the future of ecosystems such as neo liberal economic discourse and discursive constructions of consumerism 
gender, politics, agriculture, and nature. This approach does not just focus on exposing potentially damaging ideologies, but also searches for representations which can contribute to that uh, you know ecological thought or betterment, welfare of the society. The present research paper intends to focus on analyzing Tony Morrison's home from eco-linguistic perspectives in order to explore ecological views and concerns hidden inside the language of the text. The study is aimed at exploring the textual contents and discourse to find out the elements of human nature interface on the theoretical basis of eco ecological linguistics. It will examine the role of language as a vehicle to accelerate the process of healing for the characters that are bruised by the wounds inflicted by the extreme violence and racial hatred in an oppressive society and to propagate the concern for ecology and environment in a sociological background. Nature and healing. So nature has been widely represented in literature and culture as a healer, redemptive, restorative, unspoiled. In, a, in the aftermath of the First World War, writers grappled with long cultural associations between nature and healing. Uh, I quote uh, Walton, Samantha Walton, S. Walton, quotation starts, having survived a conflict in which relations between people and the living environment had been catastrophically ruptured. Writers asked, could rural and wild places offer meaningful sites of solace and recovery for traumatized soldiers? Nature known as the most helpful element of human life, it is fulfilling human needs from nutrition intake, serve of place to shelter and many human needs. However, not only that, nature also has the special power of healing the mental and physical bruises of human beings, as uh, told by Donald Oster in his book, The Wealth of Nature, that was published in 1994 from Oxford University Press. Considering the level of environmental despoliation in the world, a number of studies that focus on ecolinguistic study has been, have been carried out, like William Slaymaker in his essay, Echoing the Others, the call of global green and black African responses perceives that many African writers' resistance or avoidance of ecocritical paradigms is caused by their suspicion of a Western theory which appears as one hegemonic discourse from the metropolitan Western because African writers do not expect any Western theory to solve their environmental problems. Ignadhita Heridiana, in her article in 2018, entitled Nature's Role Toward Mental and Physical Healing, reflected on The Secret Garden by Francis Hudson Barnett, an ecocritical reading, reflects on how nature or space can be the media of mental and physical healing. Matthew Abua Ebim, in 2021, in his article, The Depiction of Environment in Literary Texts, an ecolinguistic study of Chinua Achibes, King's Palapad, takes an ecolinguistic look at the depiction of many attributes of nature in the novel Things Fall Apart by accounting for nature's reaction to the African, African colonial experience as exemplified in the said novel. S. Walton in 2007, uh, in an article, Nature Trauma, Ecology and the Returning Soldier in First World War, English and Scottish Fiction from 1980 18 to 1932, analyzes Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway, Rebecca West's The Return of the Soldier, Nancy Schaeffer's The Weather House, and Lou, uh, Louis Grassy Gibbons' Sunset Song uh, to show how these interwar literatures offer counter narratives to simplistic definitions, depictions of nature as a healing space. So, a number of studies have also been carried out to explicate the ecological discourse in the novels of Tony Morrison, like as for example, uh, Pauline P. Anderson in her thesis, Earth, Water and Black Bodies, Elements at Work in Tony Morrison's Literary Landscape, focuses on the natural elements, art and water as presented in the works of Tony Morrison and explore the complex connections between African-Americans' nature and nature. Uh, Shelley 
Maria Scousai in an article, Ecological Unconsciousness and Resistance in Toni Morrison's Selected Novels, aims to deconstruct Toni Morrison's Selected Novels through the lenses of ecocriticism to explore the non-human world encoded in Morrison's novel. So arising from this position, there is the need to study the effects and levels of environmental discourses included in the language observable in Morrison's home as exemplified in the text. Though Morrison has not shown any apparent awareness towards ecological environment in her writings, her text home reveals instances of her focusing on the theme of nature and the environment as the instrument of healing and recovery from trauma and sickness, physical as well as mental. Critical discourse analysis and Tony Morrison's home. Tony Morrison explores the relationship between the natural environment and human beings in a novel home. African Americans underwent both personal and collective traumas dated back to the time of slavery. Morrison depicts the restorative journeys of her characters from damaged victims towards self sufficient and becoming whole individuals. She deploys key elements of their recuperative process such as storytelling, rememorizing uh, a supportive community, and most significantly, return to nature and native landscape. The nature plays a significant role in the novel by accelerating the process of healing and recovery from the traumatic scars the two main characters, Frank and she, experience. Nature and landscape becomes a persona in home as Morrison presents it as a living entity which acts along with the human characters in the novel. So I uh, go to the textual analysis. Home tells the story of Frank Money, an African-American veteran traumatized by his experience in the Korean War. He has been back in America for a year, but feels too violent and dislocated to go home to Georgia, where his younger sister, C, still lives. When he returns to the United States after the war, he is haunted by memories of his childhood and the horrors he witnessed abroad. It is only when he hears that she is in danger that his life regains the sense of purpose he had lost and he ventures out to rescue his sister. As a black man in Georgia, Frank endured daily injustices and he and she are shattered by buried uh, secrets and horrible visions of racial violence. The story, to a large extent, is about the healing power of nature and native community who nurse she back to health and nurture her in her time of need and help unburdening the load of traumatic wounds that hang heavy on Frank's life. In home, nature with which African Americans have traditionally had a special bond has strong recuperative powers which contrast to the Western male concept of nature as something to be controlled and owned to pass on from, here, from year to year. In nature, blacks could find liberation during slavery and its aftermath, bringing them to their ancestral origins. There, after America, there, Afro African Americans were far from the political and cultural domain of the white people who ruled their destiny. Trees have a compelling and preeminent, uh, preeminent restorative role in Morrison's over. I quote. Uh, Wilson, uh, S.R. Wilson, markers of freedom, transformation, healing, and rebirth, the possibility of life beyond slavery's wasteland. When the monies and other black households are expelled from their houses, an elderly man, man named Crawford refuses to leave. He is killed and tied to the oldest magnolia tree that grew in his ear. Morrison says, just after dawn at the 24th hour, uh, she was beaten to death with pipes and rifle bars and tied to the oldest magnolia tree in the country, the one that grew in his own ear. Maybe it was loving that tree which he used to brag his great grandmother had planted that made him so stubborn. Thus, tree stands for endurance and life as well as a culture bearer forging ties with ancestors as the old man's great grandmother. The countryside is a compelling part of Frank and she's dear and soothing memories. While their parents walked 16 hours, brother and sister invented escapades. They loved the herd of horses that were kept in the farmland. The siblings used to sit by a stream, leaning uh, on a lightning blasted sweet bay tree uh, with two huge branches that extended like arms. Its embracing form has a clear symbolism. It protects and nourishes the little children that grow up like uh, orphans. 
uh, I quote from um, uh, the book, four barnyard swallows gathered on the lawn outside, politely equidistant from one another. They pick sauce through blades of uh, drying grass, then as if summoned all for, uh, for free work for a country. Often they sat by the stream, etc. In home, a significant amount of healing takes place within the space of homeland lotus and its welcoming community based on the natural world of countryside. The green plants and the raw ingredients of flora and fauna of the native landscape become the instrument of healing process she passes through. Ethel and other women of uh, lotus take care of she and nurse her to life. Their sincerity, love and caring is so natural and spontaneous that helps she bring back health and strength so quickly. In home, the nomenclatures or the naming of the places or parcels we are strong symbolic cohorts of healing and regenerative process from the wounds of trauma. Lotus is the name of the place to which Frank and she belong by their part. The lotus flower is regarded in many different cultures as a symbol of purity, enlightenment, self-regeneration, and rebirth. Its characteristics are a perfect analogy for the human condition. Even when its roots are in the darkest waters, the lotus produces the most beautiful flower. The loving and caring black women of lotus are representative of the community Frank and she need to return to so as to reconstruct their fracture cells. Lily is the name of the woman with whom Frank Never is Yes, sir. Yeah, please uh, try to conclude because we are uh, running out of time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please focus uh, on your uh, title only. Don't go for detailed uh, explanation. So, uh, and uh, as early as the book's epigraph, Morrison introduces in a poem that thought of nature's benevolence and something effect one longs for. And uh, here, uh, uh, Morrison's uh, uh, actually introduction of such language is so powerful, she has introduced a poem. Uh, in which the idea of home as a safe, have, uh, safe haven and an abode of peace, serenity, and quietness in the midst of natural surroundings is articulated. The speaker desires of, and dreams of her home, sweet home, that should be situated in closeness with nature. And home is a story that articulates the voice of hopefulness, uh, that language that articulates the voice of hopefulness about the possibility of recovery and transformation of, for African Americans like Frank and C. And uh, I quote a uh, I quote lines from the uh, novel. I stood there a long while staring at that tree. It looked so uh, strong, so beautiful, heart right down the middle, but alive and well. She touched my shoulder lightly, Frank. Yes, come on, brother, let's go home. So I conclude my uh, article. So language has a, always become a powerful instrument that enhances the strength of narrative that Morrison introduces in a novel. In a home, the description of numerous common and everyday phenomena of nature and landscape is so powerful and suggestive that they come out with all force and liveliness. Attributing life to the objects of nature with the use of personifications while describing the landscape of lotus gives strength to the narrative pattern that brings a deep thought of ecology to the mind of the readers. Thank you. Thank you, Nava Kumar. Welcome, sir. So we will take uh, any questions is there uh, we will take in uh, end of session. And I request all the paper presenters, please be uh, focused on your uh, title. Don't elaborate uh, uh, introduction and each and every term. Please focus on your uh, title and uh, be brief. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, my, uh, my name is Sunita, and uh, I'm the fourth speaker on the program. But I'm willing to start if. Uh, I Hello, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, you are the fourth speaker. But uh, during the beginning of the session, we missed Shivani Prakash, ma'am, due to the technical glitch. So we want to give us a chance to get together online. If not, uh, we will give you a call. If I'm allowed, may I, uh, may I ask a question and make an observation? Yes. Am I allowed to make a question? Dr. Savin Sauda, am I allowed to ask a question and make an observation? 
Thursday, a very short question. The paper was very impressive because this was a very nice kind of analysis. I must congratulate Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chanda for it. Am I not audible? Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I must congratulate Mr. Chanda for this nice research. Uh, it's a very new aspect and a new angle with which to analyze home or Tony Morrison uh, from an eco-linguistic perspective, which has not been done till date. So um, I would like to ask uh, um, Mr. Chanda, uh, what is the malady that requires healing in home? The uh, malady is of uh different kinds of injustices and uh, a different kind of racial like racial oppression and uh, gender uh, discrimination is also there and uh, basically the trauma they in my paper this uh, article the tra trauma uh, that is experienced by uh, different types of trauma that is experienced by the characters specifically Frank who uh, spend a great amount of time in war and uh, he is so traumatized to see the um, violence that happened in the warfare. And uh, again, another kind of trauma that was experienced by uh, his sister. She, uh, she uh, actually she experienced trauma. Okay, when, uh, okay. how do you see that ecolinguistically? I, how uh, do you see that ecolinguistically? Please answer. Yeah, answer I, quickly so that we move on to the next speaker. Yes, we don't yes. have much. I, so I wanted to ask you. I wanted to use of languages. That means the use of metaphors, use of uh, the symbols, the use of words that carry uh, some ideal, that carry that meaning, that exposes that the characters are, uh, you know, they are uh, in, uh, they are inclined to the nature, and they are getting some sources of healing, and they are inclination to nature give them a kind of healing touch a kind of uh, healing touch a kind of you know recuperative regenerative power that uh, they want to get and in this way the healing process initiated are you using any medical literature for that no ma'am i'm not using any medical literature all right thank you very much Yes, Sunita David, you, now you can continue your paper. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening, all fellow participants. Uh, I'm here to do a Martin Luther King Jr. speech, a letter from Birmingham jail. Uh, when we say Martin Luther King, we usually associate him with the speeches, but this is different in it being a letter from Birmingham jail. Uh, what I'm looking at is not the thought that went behind him, not the uh, historical background, but I'm looking at the language that he uses and um, uh, the metaphor and the words of power that he conveys through uh, his uh, writing. Uh, if you remember, Martin Luther King was a preacher in a Baptist church. And uh, when the time comes, he's into the civil rights movement. He jumps right into it. So uh, looking, at, uh, looking at this aspect of him, his language was uh, not just from the pulpit, but he was able to relate to the man on the street. So that is the fascinating part about uh, the strength and the muscle in his language. Uh, this is a quote from his uh, Nobel speech, his Nobel acceptance speech. And he says that the Bible tells the thrilling story of how Moses stood in Pharaoh's court centuries ago and cried, let my people go. Uh, this uh, acceptance speech uses this biblical allusion 
and metaphor. And uh, I feel this carries the resonance of a moral of the moral law. And that kind of strength that he uh, conveys through just those three words. And uh, he echoes the prophetic thunder of the Old Testament prophets in his speeches. And the, also the intellectual muscle of a Pauline uh, epistle uh, from the Bible. So he has both the intellect and um, the emotion. So it's not just heart, but it is head with the heart. So Martin Luther King Jr. visualizes and raises his subject to historic proportions. It's not just about uh, people. Uh, he gives it a history and he raises it not just a struggle, but something more than that. So the, he has this ability to share his dream with others. And uh, it enables them also to see his ideas. I mean, everyone would have been listening to his speeches right from uh, a, a, a char woman who is returning from her home, uh, returning home, and anyone could relate to them. So it is not about uh, being, uh, it is not about being bookish or being theoretical but his language was something that could resonate with the masses. So the strength of his conviction is heard, visible in his language and it's heard in his tone, carrying him on the wave of a mass movement of nonviolent civil disobedience. I'm not going to take uh, us into the comparison with what we had, the parallel that we had in India and uh, that he also drew inspiration from. But just to look at the metaphor here, in uh, I Have a Dream, he uses the metaphor for bad check. And um, he says, like uh, in 1963, when they marched to Times Square, and they uh, stood at the Lincoln Memorial, and uh, he says that uh, the bad check is the promise unfulfilled. And uh, just the picture of a bad check is uh, reduces it to a piece of paper that has denied civil rights to a people who have been rooted in the country, who have labored for the country, and have been turned away with nothing. And uh, so when the Birmingham protests came, there were several leaders of the church who turned around on him and questioned his uh, authority to come down out of the pulpit and into the street. So his answer, his response to them is very telling because here he brings both legality and morality together. So this is a very difficult balance to maintain because uh, I, I mean, um, uh, the kind of shades that, uh, the kind of subjectivity that is being brought into this is uh, it 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 it, uh, it, it uh, I mean what is down justice? But Martin Luther King felt that morality and legality could be brought together. Uh, he uses also uh, this image of family and community very frequently. So when he says, "I see my children walking hand in hand with." the white and uh, with no differences between them. And so he puts an expression on the nameless countenances of the black American. They're not just a um, mass of people, but he gives them an individuality. So it is humiliation that they live each day and it is not easy to take, but uh, uh, even as he's explaining and he's talking, he spells out and he says, uh, the kind of people I am representing here are the old, the oppressed, the battered, uh, symbolized in the 72-year-old woman in the Montgomery, Alabama, uh, you know, bus uh, uh, protest, where she, where they all uh, boy boycotted the buses. And uh, she says, my feet is tired. 
but my soul is at rest so he he is giving the need for urgency uh, an urgency because uh, people cannot wait anymore and he, um, and uh, he, he cannot wait for uh, change to take slowly but he wants a revolutionary and a quick change and it is the faces of the people it is the faces of the individual faces that he is sketching and making people understand that it is not just uh it's not just a mass per se but it is individuals who are crying out for justice um another aspect of his, the language that he uses is he takes commonly used words that have been made stale by custom and he makes them shine in use look at the word negotiation it's so used and overused but when he uses it he makes it a power word because he says we are going to force you to the table of negotiation so he is not pretending or putting on a mask of hypocrisy a uh, negotiation is going to be a tool and this negotiation is going to be used to uh, is bringing the opponent to the table and how is that by creating tension by selecting a time uh, of the year to bring pressure on the local merchants so so much has thought had gone into the single word called negotiation so negotiation in the birmingham letter is a non negotiable word there's something that uh, he will not go back and he wants the white to come to the table sit there and uh, uh, you know hear what the black has to say so civil disobedience was illegal uh, birmingham was one of the most cruel uh, uh, laws that were at that point of time and civil disobedience in that uh, city was illegal and uh, he takes this up and he says when um, <laughs> you know naming me as a christian leader and saying that it is incompatible for me to be an activist as well he says i can quote saint aquinas who says an unjust law is no law at all and uh, therefore therefore we are justified in taking up this protest so it was a very serious uh, uh you know accusation that they were the christian uh, leaders were bringing against him saying that your place uh, does not warrant you to uh, you know disobey the law when he says that you know an unjust law is no law at all and so he is uh, marking out the difference between uh, showing the hypocrisy in separating the moral law from the legal law and he's uh, you know in that word he says we've got to bring them together so justification by faith is the main theme of the pauline episodes and uh, uh, so when uh, he brings a moral law to the table he is uh, you know uncompromising and saying that just laws should follow morality so is that there can be no paradox of just and unjust laws existing together as it was in the american system so uh, you know you have a just law of assuring equal uh, uh, you know e- equal treatment to all people and then on the other hand a law that says there should be segregation in um, you know places of entertainment in schools and so on and so forth so this uh, a single quote of his says like equal rights to all means just that you cannot diverge moral from the legal law and uh, he takes a fix on the word to wait so he says we have waited for 340 years and in this situation he says patience is not a virtue so um so there's no question of uh, saying that a certain mayor who was there 
at that point of time in Birmingham. She's less radical, and therefore, um, you know, a better option. There is no, uh, no such thing as someone being less radical, but uh, it is only a question of being ready to talk. And uh, this waiting and this slow change, as he says, is no change at all. So these are basic words like uh, a law, negotiation, change that he brings to the table and he uh, makes them listen to what he has to say about these basic terms. Uh, he also brings in a new word called creative extremists. And when he's being accused of being an extremist, someone who is creating disturbance and violence in civil society, someone who's the cause of all this destruction, he, he says, remember that it is the creative extremists who have brought change in society. And uh, he gives various examples uh, from history, like uh, Socrates, and he gives, uh, uh, you know, various examples where people, if they had not been extremists in the sense of being creative extremists, things would never have changed. So the need for radical change is what he once again confirms in his letter. And his position as a church leader to intervene in a civil, uh, uh, in, in civil society and to uh, be uh, bring people down to the table okay, by the uh, tension that is created in the situation is what he openly stands for. So um, even though the leaders of the church saw his actions as precip precipitating violence, yeah, uh, it was the kind of an illogical assumption of blaming the victim for the violence of the perpetrator. So this is what he opened and laid bare in the letter from Birmingham jail. There are so many assumptions that uh, white society had made that he breaks down and he uh, uh, takes those simple words and he gives them uh, his uh, take on it. Not only that, the use of metaphor or images are so powerful, whether it's a woman on the street or it is an image from a, a Bible, an allusion from there, he makes it resonate power. So I think that uh, somehow it was language that uh, uh, drew me to the letter from Birmingham. Yeah, I conclude this. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Sunita David. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. So the next presenter, can you introduce him? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, further, am I audible? Further, Yeah, Shivani Prakash, you can start your paper presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Shivani Prakash from Patna University, and my topic is Major Themes and Concerns in Harriet Jacobs' Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. Harriet Ann Jacobs' autobiography, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, tells us about the harrowing experiences of slavery and her narrow escape to freedom in the North. She was one of the first African-American writer of the 19th century America to tell us about the story of slave experiences. At the time of publication in 1861, many critics doubted the truthfulness of Jacob's account, especially because she used the pseudonym Linda Brent in her book. The question of her identity was a serious issue because Jacobs was forced to say that women 
one should not be capable of writing about a controversial issue like slavery. According to Sandra Gilbert and Susan Guber, the literary woman has always faced degrading options when she had to define her public presence in the world. If she did not publish it pseudonymously, she would modestly confess her female limitations and concentrate on the lesser subjects reserved for ladies as becoming to their inferior par. Jacob and other 19th century female authors were not similar to male in terms of writing characteristics and subject matter. They were therefore considered inferior. The writing of these women often seems odd in relation to the predominantly male literary history defined by the standards of what we have called the patriarchal poetics, 19th century American writers. Women writers do not seem to fit into any of these categories to which our literary historians have accustomed us. Moving on, Jacob was born in 1813 in Edenton, North Carolina. At the age of six, her mother died and she was taken to her mistress's home, Margaret Hornblow, who was very kind and supportive to her. She taught her how to read and write, but unfortunately her mistress died and she was, when 12, was willed to her three-year-old niece. But from here, the pain and obstacles for Jacob's life started. The niece's father, Dr. James Norcom, that is, Dr. Flint, in her book, was a cruel and torturous man and had tried many attempts of sexual encounter towards Jacobs. To escape this sexual encounter and harassment, she engaged in sexual liaison with the white man, Mr. Saver. Mr. Saver was a prestigious man in the town and a prominent figure who was well recognized. Dr. Norcom feared that if he abused Jacobs, news about his wrongdoing will spread by Saver which will tarnish his image. So she was kept aloof. Dr. Norcom continued threatening Jacobs and shift, told her that she would shift her to the plantation if she refused him. Jacob accepted the offer working as a plantation slave rather than a domestic one. Through the course of many incidents, Jacob was then confined into a sh tiny shed by her grandmother, Martha, and finally she escaped to North and started working as a nanny for the family. She used to send money to her family so that she could get her children back. Finally, Dr. Norcom died and his daughter sold Jacobs for freedom. In the preface of the text, Jacob, that is Linda Brent, says about the important reason for writing the book. She says, I want to add my testimony to that of abler pens to convince the people of the free states what slavery really is. Only be experienced can one realize how deep and dark and foul is that pit of abdominations. May the blessings of the God rest on the imperfect effort in behalf of my persecuted people. Elaine Showalter also examined the formulation of American literary canon in her books, such as A Literature of Their Own and The New Feminist Criticism. She talks about the inclusion of marginalized women writers, such as Harriet Jacobs. According to Showalter, the central theme of men's text was to exclude women completely. So women need to create a literary canon or a tradition of their own. The first step in doing so is to look back at the literature which has already been produced and value which is inherent in the text, neglecting whether men consider it to be important or not. So, Showalter discovered that there are many women's texts, including Jacob's, have common themes. The first theme is duplicity. When things look good on the surface, but underneath the world of the heroine or the protagonist is in chaos. The inner struggle and pain with many emotions put together comprises her world. The second theme is that of the disease which includes hatred or disgust for her own body. The female views this moment. Very important.
theme is double. One side expresses the dutiful women, and the other side expresses the rage. Another theme which is very much prominent is the obsessive images of confinement in women's writing. All these themes are apparent in incidents in the life of the slave girl, written by Jacobs. Now, Jacob is there in the search of the self. One of the most recurring image issues in the text is binary oppositions. Jacob seems to fall into the pit of self and other. For example, in many instances, the protagonist Linda Brent is lost with no sense of self, yet engrossed in the system of slavery and totally submitted her life to slavery and her children and her family. Jacob uses the pseudonym Linda Brent to address her character in her autobiography. She is portrayed as a strong woman, independent in her will, but at the same time, she is seen as a defeated, weak, and silenced by the abuses or, and torture of Dr. Flint. Another instance of binary issue can be seen in the black slave women and white mistresses, that is the domestic slave and white mistress. There is a theme of women's space, and Jacob was trapped in the tiny shed by her grandmother for seven years, which can be seen as a symbol of slavery. Jacob sets this up as a binary was weak she was weak physically trapped in the tiny shed but at the same time independent in her own decision about her plans to escape and free her children from the trap trap of slavery the psychological abuses of slavery most slave narratives emphasize the physical brutality and deprivation that slaves were forced to endure, presenting gory descriptions of beating and lynching to shock the reader. Jacob does not ignore such issues, but her focus on slaves' mental and spiritual anguish was makes an important contribution to this genre. As a slave with relatively easy life, Linda does not have to endure constant beatings and hard physical labor, however, she and many of the other slaves around her suffer greatly from being denied the basic human rights and legal protection. Men and women are not permitted to marry whoever they choose. They often are not allowed to marry at all. Women are frequently forced to sleep with their masters they despise. Worst of all, families are torn apart with children sold to a place far away from their parents. Thus, even slaves who are not beaten or starved are stripped of their humanity. When Linda states that she would rather be desperately poor English farm labor than a pampered slave, she undergoes the point that slavery's mental cruelty is every bit as devastating as its physical abuse. Another important theme here is domestic city as paradise and prison. At the end of incidents, Linda states that she is still waiting to have her greatest dream fulfilled of cheating, of creating a real home for uh, herself and her children. The desire for comfortable and safe home runs throughout this book, reflecting the cult of domesticity that would have been familiar to Jacob's mostly white female readers in the 19th century. During Jacob's time, women were like, relegated to the domestic sphere and expected to find all of their fulfillment in caring for their homes and children. Women were considered to housewives by their very nature unfit for any other kind of life. As a black woman, excluded from the value system, unable even to live with her children, Linda's Longing for home was understandable. <coughs> the idea of racism was very evident in those times. Because of this racism, Brent was very much careful in dealing with Mrs. Flint. Mrs. Flint was very jealous of Linda Brent because she knew there was her. She was part.
Alice, to prevent that, realizes this fact and was very empathetic towards Mrs. Flint. She never detested her. She says, yes, I am, whom she detested so bitterly, had far more pity for her. I never wronged her or wished wrong for her. This relationship in the text shows the glimpse of binarism, even though Mrs. Flint and Linda Brent belong to two different worlds. But because of the same gender, she could feel the pain and emotion of Mrs. Flint. These instances in the text clearly describes Jacob's contrasting character which fluctuates between her own self-identity and other. It describes how since childhood she was unknown of the real world but gradually when she grew up and faced the real world it was really challenging and difficult for her to face it. The question of self-identity was of utmost importance. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. So, how many presenters are still more? I think the last one. Last one? Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon to everyone. And being the last speaker, I hope I'll be able to engage you people with my talk. My paper is titled Poetry and Protest, Race, Identity, and Feminism in African-American Protest Poetry. Literature with its diverse forms has served a plethora of function in human civilization. Literature in general and protest poetry in particular have been vocal about human condition and its problems. It employs language for writing back, questioning norms, resisting atrocities, and creating the scope for change. Further, it can act as a vital tool to inculcate empathy, defemorize reality, reflect on human nature, and can also lead to social and political change. The autobiographies, essays, letters, memoirs, biographies, etc., of great luminaries and history of several revolutions reveal to us how literature shaped their thinking and influenced them to become an agent of change. Be it the influence of works of Tolstoy and Gita, Gita on Mahatma Gandhi, Chapman's Momo on Keats, Walden on W.B. Yeats. The Sufis on Doris Lessing, Birds of Fanon on Algerian Revolution, Pearson's Silent Spring on climate activists, uh, activists and policy makers, literature has greatly contributed in shaping the history of the world. The protest literature in its varied forms has contributed in this daunting task. Protest literature has existed in various forms throughout the literary history. In its broader sense, it encompasses media in the form of film and photography, as well as fiction and poetry. This form of literature, as a powerful mode of social analysis, provides a voice to societal sentiments apart from invocation or demand for change. Several writers have used to call upon injustices at local or global levels thereby awakening the society at large. As a form of art, it concentrates on doing away with the society's problems, injustices, and can either support or oppose social and political situations or laws. It may also serve as a document to inform people about a situation that can have everlasting consequences. Several literatures in the contemporary time on climate change serve as an example in this matter. Within the corpus of literature contributed by African-American writers, the aspect of poet protest remains a central model. The most dominant of the issues that resonates in these works are slavery, racism, gender inequality, political corruption, 
and other problems in the decolonized world. African American protest poetry. The category of African American pro protest poetry is large. Owing to the large expanse of time during which it has been written, and also because of the great numbers of poets who have contributed to this form of writing. African American protest poets, may, uh, sorry, African American protest literature can be defined as a form of literature aiming to bring back, readdress to the secondary status of the black people of attempting to achieve the acceptance of black people into the large American body politic, of encouraging practitioners of democracy truly to live up to what democratic ideals of American soil mean. In the light of the above definition, African American protest literature aims to articulate the inequalities on the basis of color, gender, ethnicity, and instill the spirit to make amends to forego such injustices. The account of socioeconomic and political inequality in America has a long history. It may be traced back to the civilizing mission, leading to the evils of slavery. This led to the widespread hatred amongst the people of color who were brutalized, exploited, and discriminated by the dominant white American African Americans. African American writers have used poetry beside drama, fiction, and essays to address these issues. Most of the wrong in our society is not new, and so are the atrocities done on the African American. And the wrong is always resented. African American showed their resentment in a number of ways, and one of the finest tools for this is poetry. Protest poetry includes the entire predicament that the African Americans are living in from the earliest to the contemporary times. Its poetry questions the very belief on which the foundation of America lies and what was being practiced. A country like America, whose foundation was laid on the belief and idol of democracy, slowly led to a group of groups to enslave the other. Not only this, they justified the Jim Crow law. This led the oppressed group to question and ascertain their rights. They used poetry to address these issues. But since this category is so large, African American protest poetry is divided into three subcategories on the basis of time period during which they were written. The first deals with protest poetry written during slavery. Second, during segregation and the Jim Crow laws, and the third, with, after the political obstacles to uh, inequality were presumably removed. The paper aims to explore the themes of few protest poets writing in different historical epochs, contrasting and highlighting the themes of their work. Before 1865, most African American writers wrote protest poetry to bring an end to slavery and their audience were basically Northern sympathizers. The poets that can be included in this category are Phyllis Weekly, George Moses Horton, Francis Harper, Paul Lawrence, Dunbar. Poets of Harlem Renaissance took up where Harper and Dunbar left, forming second category of the protest poets, that is once written during the racial segregation and Jim Crow era. The Jim Crow laws were a collection of local and state statutes that legalized discrimination on the basis of race. These laws existed for about 100 years, denying marginalized African Americans the right to vote, hold office, or get an education. The segregation was so acute that the Africans were forbidden to use public parks, theaters, restaurants, and waiting rooms used by the whites. Even marriage between the black and the white people was strictly forbidden. An oppressive law like this led to vigorous opposition, wherein protest poetry contributed greatly. Poets like Hughes, Mackey, Cullen, 
commented on the social and economic condition of people seemingly doomed to second class citizenship by violence that victimized them. The socio economic condition that keeps them locked in poverty and unwavering resentment that turns hope into resignation. Protest poetry in the third period consists of writers associated with black aesthetic and black arts movement. The black arts movement on one hand resisted the Western influence and on the other hand celebrated the black experience. Their poem, apart from criticizing Americans and its capitalist practices and racism, aims to encourage the black people to appreciate and accept themselves while rejecting the white society that, de that denigrates them. Amiri Barak, who began his publishing career in 1950s, shared his poetic sentiments with, his, with the beat poet. He became an iconic figure of the protest of 1960s in a variety of genres, his most militant poem being the black art, feminism, racism, and identity. An acclaimed African-American poet, Maya Angelou, remains an important voice within the category of protest poet. She joined the Harlem Writers Guild and her poetry addressed issues on which the poets of Harlem Renaissance wrote, that is, social and political subjugation of the Black people. In addition to this, she also addressed the issue of patriarchal dominance existing for centuries. Born in Northern California in 1928, Angelo was a poet beside being a civil rights activist and an author for a series of autobiographies. Her ability to overcome racism and other forms of oppression in her personal life made her a prominent spokesperson speaking for the cause of Black and women throughout her literary career. The paper aims to demonstrate the themes of racism, feminism, and struggle for identity through her notable poem. Her poem, Alone, calls for human unity in the face of atrocity, where poet uses repetition to deliver her message. Alone, all alone, nobody. But nobody can make it out here alone. The poem is based on the universal theme of isolation and suffering. The so the last poem, please yes, conclude. Yeah. Uh, just, just five minutes. So two minutes more, I'll do it. The atrocities came the poem is based on the universal theme of isolation and suffering. Her, another poem, Cage Bird, written during the period of civil rights in America, became a symbol for the black race devoid of human rights and their freedom being curtailed. She has also written poems like Still I Rise and Phenomenal Women, both of which talks about gender inequality. The poem, Phenomenal Women, is a counter of praise of the inherent beauty in a woman who can challenge restrictive notions of feminine beauty. Similar is the work of Naomi Wolf in The Beauty Myth, which talks about the pressure on women to follow unrealistic, unattainable social standards of physical beauty and how these expectations undermine women psychologically and physically. Though the poem does not explicitly address the issue of racism, the aspect of racist race remains a significant one in phenomenal women. In another poem, Just Give Me a Cool Drink of Water Before I Die, is a contributing word where she talks about gender and race. The first part primarily deals with the themes of love, and the second one, especially about anguish and the suffering of the Black African American. The second one is more combative in tone. It complements the survivors, the Blacks, who have prevailed despite the gender and sorry, the race inequalities they suffer. The last line of one of her very famous poems, Sepia Fashion Show, where she says, I'd remind them, please, look at those knees you got at Miss Anne's stuffing. Shows how black women 
were to a place used to show their knees in order to prove how hard they had been. There also were of Harlem hopscotch uh, because of the time uh, constraint I cannot speak. I just uh, conclude my words by saying that if one looks at the contemporary protest poetry and the African American poets of the recent times, one can find thousands of poems on the same subject, which concerns the three parameters of protest poetry discussed about. Protest poets like Amanda S. C. Gorman writes on the themes of oppression, feminism, race, and marginalization, as well as African American sorry, African diaspora. She is influenced by the work of Maya Angelou. She is the first person to be named as the Youth Poet Laureate. Her poem, The Hill We Climb, is a powerful call to action focusing on the themes of hope, unity, healing, and resilience. As one goes on reading, exploring, and critically engaging with the category of protest poetry, one finds it to be interesting, mystical, and dark. That was on my thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sadaf. Uh, now uh, the session is open for questions. Any questions? Couple of questions uh, can be allowed. If no questions are there, uh, then I'll conclude. Is anyone there? Okay, then, uh, so I congratulate all the paper presenters. They have presented uh, in a different genres. The operation remains the same. So whatever the mode, it's maybe poetry or drama or fiction or uh, letters or whatever it is. So all the paper presenters have uh, justified their uh, titles. And in America, uh, the blacks from uh, 16th century to George Floyd, there is indeed uh, the racism existing in America. And the people with uh, supremacy, uh, white supremacy, or race, everything uh, in their uh, psychic, so they behave in a such a manner that uh, we are superior and some people are inferior based on race or caste or gender or creed or so on. So this will happen. And uh, we can see that uh, even George Obama, uh, George, uh, Barack Obama also uh, became a president also. There are only a, a few instances uh, we can see that uh, it's not completely uh, uh, overnight some changes will happen in the lives of the blacks. It cannot because it, it completely depends on the civilized society in which we live and uh, the people in that society should accept all the people in respect of their uh, uh, race and other things. Similarly in India to uh, in caste system prevailing uh, from centuries together but still, uh, you can see a number of instances which is happening uh, every day around our, uh, in and around our states. So this is, uh, first, we need to have uh, respect the individual entity or individuals as individuals. Don't look that they are men or women or they are this caste or that race or this race. So if you go uh, uh, counting on these things, definitely the society will be stratified. And such stratification is not at all good for a, a civilized society. And moreover, all the civilized societies are in one way or another way is oppressive only. So I uh, thank uh, the organizers uh, who gave this opportunity uh, to all the paper presenters. And uh, uh, they have given me chance to chair this session. And one uh, uh, long, uh, one uh, last thing that uh, yesterday, uh, two days back, I think, we have lost a, a writer and social activist, Gail Amit. She done uh, her uh, research on Ambedkar and Dalits, and all the way she came from America to India, and she settled in Maharashtra, and she wrote extensively 
uh, on uh, dalits and uh, especially uh, phule ambedkar and his agitation farms and uh, thereon she also participated in number of n number of uh, agitations uh, along with the dalits so she is no more uh, 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 just i wanted to say that uh, jai bhim uh, to gail ambedkar and thank you uh, ausip and thank you dr konda for giving this opportunity with this uh, this session will be concluded thank you sir thank you yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Kunda.